much, 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 much later in the series will complicate that. But at this level, it's just obvious to understand that my perception of depth um, and my ability to grasp objects with my hands is going to lead me into the world to grab the epistemology book and show you. There is, in a sense, a correspondence between what I thought was the distance between myself and the book, the amount of pressure I needed to hold the book, it worked, right? So it matched my idea, in a sense, matched what existed in the external world, which is demonstrated by my ability to show you that I've achieved the task. It's a very minimal task, but I've, I've accomplished something today. I've picked up my epistemology book to demonstrate it to the world, right? Okay, so, you know, I apologize for the, just the profound simplicity of this but I'm a very, very big fan on overkilling detail, right? So that once we get to more advanced levels, we have a very, very solid foundation. I don't want to make any assumptions. Okay, number four. So um, see my discussion on Descartes' methodological skepticism at the 532 mark here. Click the link, watch it. I forget what I'm discussing at that point, but I'm, I'm talking about the methodological, the process of methodological skepticism, which is the skeptical account roughly is the account which isn't negating or denying the existence of the external world. It doesn't have to be that profound. You're not saying that the external world does not exist. The idea is that I'm going to be skeptical of the relationship between what is and my awareness of what is, and I'm continually going to be reassessing both the nature of existence and the contents of my mind. Right? So that this relationship between the perceiver and the external world is a perpetual, ongoing relationship within epistemological discourse. And we're going to complicate this with so many nuanced facets that it'll, 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 it'll drive some of you away from the epistemology lecture series because it's going to be, again, you know, several, several hours, 10, 20, maybe 30 hours um, to process some of this stuff, and I might not even, I mean, I guess I can finish. On the epistemology series, I should be able to finish, because there has to be a definitive end. Okay, so just watch that. Number five, quote, this is a quote from the text now. Descartes' question about his knowledge is concerned with everything he believes or takes to be true, right? And the emphasis is in the original, right? So the question of my knowledge, right, or Descartes' knowledge, to be specific, is concerned with everything, right? The totality, um, for the for the methodological S K E P for the methodological skeptic, um, she is questioning the totality, and this is what's important, right? The totality of the contents of her knowledge. Right? The methodological skeptic, she is challenging the totality, the complete totality of the contents of her knowledge. Two super critical points. We'll get a little bit deeper now because this really is sort of the governing discourse of section 1.1 of my notes. But the idea is this. One, how can we make sense of the totality of someone's knowledge? Right? In what sense is our knowledge organized, right? What is the organizational unit or structure of knowledge? I have my knowledge of things that I've experienced. I have my knowledge, this is just an example. I have, an, I have knowledge of the things that I've experienced and I categorize that into a grouping. I have my knowledge of the movies I've watched and I categorize that into a grouping. But obviously the movies that I've watched and the things that I've experienced conflate. Because all the movies that I've watched are things that I've experienced, but not all of the things that I've experienced are movies that I've watched. So that there are um, some overlaps within the sets of knowledge. And just to be clear, I don't want to complicate it too much. I mean, that should have been, that, that shouldn't be difficult. You can't experience, you can't watch a movie without experience, experiencing the movie. Thus, all of the movies you've watched are things that you've experienced. However, you can't experience things that aren't movies. For example, my experience of picking this up has nothing to do with movies. I guess in a sense it's a movie for you, but this is real life for me. But <laughs> it's too early for jokes. So anyway, um, 
it's too early for jokes, especially when you're laughing at epistemology jokes that you've created yourself, right? That's even more strange. But, you know, I'm not going to overkill that point. It should be obvious, right? That's, so, what's very important is, for the methodological skeptic, she's engaging the world in such a manner that she is assessing the totality, collectively, of the contents of her knowledge. And the question is then, once we make this realization, and I, this is what I love about philosophy, is that it's a very sort of gradual analysis into the conceptual narrative, right? It follows, right? Okay, at this point in the analysis, if we recognize that we're going to challenge the things that we see in the external world, and the things that we see in the external world, we recognize where there is, at, at this level, a correspondence breakdown between the things that I think and the things that are, then we have um, an inability to function properly, quote unquote, in the world. Thus, we recognize, this becomes problematic later, right, and we'll talk about the problems that I think exist in sort of contemporary, now I'm, I, I jumped like off the bridge real quick, but just for those of you that already get this stuff, um, contemporary discourse on autism makes some of these very, very foundational, I would argue, um, epistemological grievous errors in understanding, be precisely because they think that functionality um, can be normativized epistemologically. Um, I apologize for the people who just started watching, that was profoundly deep, but for those of you that get it, part of the, the enormous problem in a lot of um, autism discourse in a contemporary set setting is just an inability to understand just the basics of epistemology, right? Because there tends to be um, the, the possibility of demonizing or dehumanizing um, the autistic individual's interaction in the world because there is, a, there is an ingrained inability to properly perceive the external world. Thus the problem lies within the individual and obviously there's nothing wrong with the external world and you know that's a problem. I think. I think that's a huge problem. Um, so in, in, in sort of defense of the autistic community. So uh, for those of you who are, are interested, grad students at this level, this, this is not really a grad level lecture, this is, a, this is an intro lecture, this is like a, an intro to intro lecture, right? This is a very basic lecture. But you can take some of these concepts and complicate it. If you're a grad student and you're watching this right now, though this is more designed for undergrads, I would, um, I would suggest you looking into sort of uh, contemporary philosophical discourses on epistemology and the way in which the autistic community has misappropriated, in some sense, our discourse, our language, our concepts, right? It's been, it's been misappropriated, I think, gr grievously by, uh, by specialists, whatever that means. Um, the number six, the epistemological dilemma then is the means in which an individual can holistically Right? The whole point of epistemology at this very sort of rudimentary level is a means of holistically scrutinizing the totality of one's belief. I want to be able to scrutinize the contents of my beliefs. Okay, and this is precisely what's at stake, right? We want to understand, we want to understand if this box represents the sum total of the perceiver's beliefs in the world, we want to be able to scrutinize and assess and ultimately organize taxonomically the contents of an individual's beliefs. What complicates, obviously, this process is the inability to physically manipulate the contents of an individual's mind. It's not like the contents of your desk. You can open your desk, see what are in the drawers, take the paper clips, sort those, take the thumbtacks, sort those, take the staples, stuff, sort those, take the documents, sort those, and you can have a listing of the contents of the desk. Our mind doesn't at all lend itself to such organization, so what epistemology at this level does is, is it attempts to formalize a system in which we go about the conceptual organization of our the sum total of our knowledge, right? Um, very, for me, super interesting, right? I, I like stuff like this because I think this is how you should get started in a discourse in epistemology because it makes it somewhat of a, you know, a, a, a cloak and dagger, uh, Hardy Boys, old school sort of detective drama. How, how am I going to know what it is that I don't even know, right? How is it that I'm going to organize the things that I do know? You know, so we'll talk about this uh, in, a, in a few seconds. <laughs> 
I'm jumping around here with respect to what I write on the board, but I've discussed all of it. Number seven, 